Uh, today I'd like to talk about um, the great progression uh, within the GD, how people uh, tend to view the grades in the Gondon and perhaps how that differs from the way it was originally intended. And uh, I mean, in my training uh, with you over the years, I've come to view uh, Gondon progression quite differently than it was presented to me when I first started out with uh, with other people. And um, and uh, I think it's a it's an interesting topic to discuss because uh, it changes the entire view we have of the going on and what it means in a personal uh, in a person's life uh, in terms of what the grades actually bring and what they do for a person and uh, I guess where I'm getting at is uh, a lot of people today equate uh, grades in the GD with actual spiritual attainment as if all of a sudden being initiated into a particular grade um, will suddenly make the person more enlightened or more um, uh, having achieved this particular place say on the tree of life and as a result uh, uh, people will put a, a certain ceiling to where one can get in the, in the Gondan for example uh, the third order I mean we know the SM obviously used the third order grades but a lot of people today even debate the possibility of that because obviously to be in the supernals in the flesh would be something impossible if we were to view say 8 equals 3, 9 equals 2 as grades that actually represented these states of being and uh, I'd like to hear your views on this. Well, it's a tough one because I don't know if I'm really qualified to answer that because I've changed my mind greatly over the years on this as you tend to, as one tends to do as you try and evolve within the order. Um, okay, well let's let's look at the tree of life, I think we'll start there. The tree of life, of course, within the grade structure is um, uh, you've broken it down into four worlds within one tree, but the reality was that the Golden Dawn essentially used uh, uh, four worlds, uh, four levels in, in, in one world. In the Seer, for example, uh, the grade levels were given and they were given on the physical plane, so they have to be all have to be in a Seer. So you would have the Seer of a Seer, then you'd have Yetzirah of a Seer, Etc. And so, when 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 you look at grades, you've got to look at it in the sphere of a seer, but different the different aspects of a seer. So, uh, so you're looking at uh, looking at that concept. And Mathers actually mentions this: uh, the the seer of a seer and Yetzirah of a seer, Bria of a seer, and so forth, uh, through the through the flying rolls here and there. And uh, and also, I think in his uh, book, um, uh, I'm not too sure about that Kabbalah and Veil, but I did know that it was mentioned within the order papers. And the problem was everyone else took it differently. They said, "Oh no, you can't get up to Bria, uh, which is uh, A3 status because of the archangels." The reality, that's a totally different ball game. You're looking at a, the tree of a seer, uh, a seer of a seer, or, or Bria of a seer. You're not looking at Bria, Bria as a total entity in itself, but still part of the boundary of a sea around it, and that seems to be the problem. Yeah, actually, Mathers, I think, is quite clear with this in uh, a particular passage in uh, Ritual U, which I'll, I'll post here. <coughs> well, in this particular passage, it... obviously, Mathers shows that... Uh, uh, the whole that a man can actually attain in the flesh is is always going to be within the bounds of the Asiya tree uh, because he does obviously address the fact that once you reach say full communion or union with the higher self what he calls the Kether of Asiya uh, then you would enter or uh, have a point of contact with the higher genius in the in the world of Yetzirah and the angels and obviously that would uh, that would be probably the end of one's life and beyond so it's uh, it's quite clear, in, like in Ritual U, in that passage, I just showed that uh, Mathers intended for the whole of the progression of a Gondon magician to be within the Asiya tree. Um, so, where what I think is uh, helps bring in another perspective, because a lot of people think that once you get, say, into uh, Tifrat in five six, you're essentially working entirely within Yetzirah, and and that seems a bit contradictory because it wouldn't obviously mean that you're not really there physically or completely disconnected from physical reality or physical reality but um i think personally a point that reconciles this is a, a diagram called the jacob's ladder where the four trees actually overlap onto each other where the malkut of yetzira ends up in tifrit itself and it would also explain perhaps the reason for the subgrades in five six because you'd end up with the malkut of yetzira at that point 
I think it can bring something interesting to look at it in that sense, because you still end up working through the Asiya tree. However, the Yatsira aspects uh, that you start working with would start with five, six, and beyond, um, as shown in the diagram of the Jacob's Ladder here. Yeah, well, this is this is the uh, this is the important thing. See, uh, it's only been in recent years that people have come to accept that Mathis was actually talking about the tree of Asir only and the different variations within it, and not and not uh, not the division of uh, Bria as a separate tree. Uh, so I think uh, Wang's book uh, uh, on the on the tarot he did a drawing there, which wasn't a bad one. I've seen some other versions, but that that's not a bad one. In breaking it up and showing you at a moment's notice. And the problem you've got is that a lot of people don't really accept it, and some do, some don't. So you have different value systems between people, saying you could never go beyond the, um, the seven four. It's impossible because their value system has them. Uh, they're looking at the uh, Yetzir as a separate tree to to to, uh, to a seer, and uh, they shouldn't be in a seer in the first place if they thought like that. Uh, so the reality, the reality is that uh, you've got you've got to get your structures right um, in that. Mm. Uh, what about uh, further developments? I mean, uh, we know obviously the GD was developed up to five equals six. The ZAM materials, some THAM, and then uh, nothing beyond. I mean, you, you talk about this on the forums all the time. Um, I mean, we know the SM. Obviously, I had a 6.5 and 7.4 initiation, and as I said earlier, um, possibly 8.3 and 9.2 as well. Um, but the 6.5 and 7.4 rituals, in my opinion, are so disconnected from everything that came before, it seems a bit dysfunctional. And, and uh, there's some good elements in those rituals, obviously. Um, but uh, I think there's a lack of continuity in developments uh, from 5.6 and beyond, uh, or beyond 5.6, rather, in the SM. In the AO, I mean, what we've seen of the AO 6.5, it's uh, it's completely lacking in substance and any kind of teachings or any kind of again continuity in terms of uh, introducing different concepts and ideas as the other rituals did before that. So, uh, what is the solution in your opinion for six five and beyond for the orders out there and including the work we're doing? Oh, that's a big one. Uh, look, the bottom line out of this is the value system of uh, the ritual itself and what's in the what's in the ritual and people seem to have a different value system they place on it uh i i would think that <coughs> to, to to look at this in its entirety you can look at it in a block wise i would suggest you look at how you view the actual ritual itself and and how you look at the value systems within the ritual now we're just looking at ritual in general and then uh i'll uh, i'll go further into the different difference between the outer and inner in a order, um, for example, uh, the, we didn't have uh, when, when the GD first came out. They never had tools to how to evaluate the grade properly. Uh, you see what Mathers did in the Z uh, in the Z1 and the Z3, which wasn't bad, but it's nothing compared to what we can do today with the tools uh, that we have at our disposal uh, to to break ritual down. And uh, when you one of the things is. Uh, one of the schools, and this is just a school, it's not the school, is transpersonal um, psychology, which is uh, the psychology beyond the ego, looking at the, the pure essence of something, trying to get a hold of it, uh, to try and figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, it's, it's beyond the stage of uh, non-ordered consciousness. And uh, they have different levels within that. They have uh, multi-states, which is uh, the non the, the unconscious to a certain extent and you have the uni state which is the reality you deal with so you have those two elements essentially it comes down to the conscious and the unconscious if you want to put a glib term on it and when you get into these areas like a transpersonal astrology you can actually start breaking some aspects of the ritual down within that confines uh, the problem the problem you've got is what you're left with is a series of wheels within wheels the boundaries of uh, one ritual and another are often blurred and uh, you have to understand that the boundary between one ritual and another is often a benchmark. Uh, the rituals, the rituals themselves, form a holographic component. And uh, the holographic component is uh, you have a um, what's the best way to describe it? You have an unfolding process where you try and put together the unconscious and the conscious together. 
if you if you look at a holographic area, uh, you're looking at uh, it, there's about three three fundamental phases to it. Now I'm not a physicist; I can't tell you the maths of it. I can just tell you the layman's version, and I'm sure people could pick me up and go a lot further than what I've done. But <clears throat> the concept of a holographic component, and that's applied to almost every ritual we do, and even certain parts of the ritual, as as you want to view them, you uh, you have like an implicate order. That's uh, actually measuring the invisible aspects within the ritual itself. That produces a holographic component. Now, one is the thing is when you look at certain parts of the ritual, and each part is contained the whole. That means you can relate in, in terms of GD holographic work. You can look at each part and then relate it to the whole of the GD in one way, shape, or form. It has tentacles going to it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you tend to merge. You lose your present when you're doing the ritual. Past, present, and future start to merge within the ritual as far as it actually goes. And I think that the um, below that is a matrix of the actual ritual. In the outer order, for example, is the elemental aspect, which we'll get into in a minute. So when you've got all these things going on, these are all tools that you can use to break it down. And people do, don't go in that direction very, very often, and, and I think they should, because these tools should be used so that we can see how ritual goes. But what you get in the end is you don't get... Uh, oh, OK, let's, let's, let's look at something. We'll look at the titles of the actual... Say the outer order. You've got these rituals titles like Zelata, Theoricus, etc. Now that came from a period prior to the Golden Dawn. Uh, all you've got to do is look at Frater Robertus's handbook, look at uh, chapter 7 on the back, and he talks about starting at the Zelata and how that works in alchemical things from an old document, uh, whether or not that's part of some Ros obscure Rosicrucian order, I don't know. I'm not, my expertise is not in that area to tell you. Yeah, but it also... <coughs> Yeah. Okay, well, what happens then is that these names that you put in the Golden Dawn have very, very little to do with anything. Uh, so it, it's just a name. At Fairy Roa, they never called something by the elemental grade of earth, air, fire, and water. They called it by its proper name, the Zealotor, etc. They didn't, they didn't bother with that, or sometimes they might relate to the uh, 110. But generally, it was in, within that confine. So they looked at the ritual as an entirety and not the elemental status that today some people view the ritual as. And uh, and that is the uh, that, that that's a major component. Um, so the names don't really mean too much. And when you get through the uh, the, the names and, and and the titles of the varying levels, which Math has tried to do in the six five, uh, you don't get much out of it. it. As far as the ritual goes, there's very very little. And uh, some people have tried to um, make more of this. Uh, Paul Case uh, is. Uh, True and Invisible Order. I had a look at his book this morning. Actually, it wasn't too bad. This is the original version. He tried to break these rituals down, try and get something out of it. And so did Dion Fortune and a few others. But what you got with them was not just one glib term for a grade to some, try and summarize it. You got essentially a whole ball of teachings, which were all amalgamated together in multi-levels. And that's the way they viewed them in Furirara, and I'm pretty sure they did in the GD. The elemental aspect is a matrix underneath. It was a knitting factor, but it wasn't the primary factor uh, to um, to get them to, init to be initiated in. And within that, within the ritual itself, you had certain points that we call null points, which are, which are points of uh, people coming together and some, providing a, a, a eureka moment in the ritual, and you have a varying level of those, and each of these has their own value system. Now, when you put this all together, you've got to dissect all of this, which is with the tools that you've got today, it can be incredibly difficult. But then you try and put a glib term on it, say, I have got my 110 and I'm, I'm now 110, what have I achieved? Uh, and, and the first thing they do is spout off the um, the title and try and relate it to, to something, achieving something, and, and it doesn't relate at all. It's part of the traditional traditional understanding. Some people have tried to force a square peg into a round hole by doing those titles, but they're calm, comfortable with them. I don't have a problem with them. I think, fine, it's part of the egregore of some other stream coming into it. That's good. But when you're in a GD, you've got to think, okay, what does it mean? How does it relate to what we're doing? And as a result of that, you don't get it from the titles. And so you've got a different entity in itself because the GD is separate. Um, it's like taking the GD and taking it back to the original chemical order and saying, right, you do all this stuff. It's scratch their head and say, what the hell are we doing?
Yeah, back in the Golden Rosen Courts, I mean, these titles were specifically applied to the varying degrees in Theoricus. Uh, for example, they received a lot of the theory for uh, laboratory work and things like that, and they would get all the practical application in practicus and so on and so forth. So these names actually did have a full relevance back then, but yes, definitely in GD it's uh, not as pertinent. Um, I think that, I mean, uh, what I was uh, addressing at the beginning of this conversation uh, regarding what people make of the GD grades is a... Uh, it's a big thing, especially in, in considering the, like further developments in 6.5, 7.4, and beyond, because if people uh, don't understand uh, what a GD grade is supposed to uh, accomplish, or say even how the ritual is supposed to work hand-in-hand -hand with that, it's going to be very difficult to develop higher levels and keep uh, a similar pattern going. Because, I mean, in the end, a GD grade is, is meant to do what? To introduce us to a variety of concepts, ideas, uh, uh, forces and forms in the universe uh, through, uh, obviously through an initiation and then presented in the form of teachings. And those are opportunities for the person to investigate uh, the universe within and without. But to say that by the time a person, say, leaves Zelator, they would have mastered the element of Earth or something like that is a bit, is a bit of an illusion. Uh, in the end, the whole progression is really more about the process than, uh, than a very specific end result expected at each level. Um, and, and obviously we know that the grades obviously are, are, are done on the on the tree of life so to investigate every sephira would uh, would be the logical thing to do I mean once we reach say some four adeptus exemptus there are still things and concepts that the tree of life describes in life and in the, in the world around us to explore with say Bina and Hakma and things like that um, well you're right um... It's, it can be it can be a it can be a very very confusing situation you know and how you want to break all these things down just just one way or another but I think I think what you've got to do is you've got to you've got to look at the GD grades in different levels you just can't look at it as one as a one-stop shop uh, you've got to look at the anthropological past so that means you have a rite of passage you've achieved that within the order that's the first thing and that's the that's anthro coming through and a rite of passage means that you have achieved a certain level. You've gone from one to the next. And that's very, very important from a psych psychological viewpoint. Uh, what you've achieved magically within your psyche is very, very different levels. You could bring my book in on alchemy and look at what's achieved in the, in the Zelator in that particular book and how it's worked. That's just one area. So you start to see things knitting on that level. But the reality is you've got a whole bunch of conjunctions within the ritual itself. And so that you're you've worked incrementally so each ritual is a series of incremental steps and within these steps there are other incremental steps like tree within a tree and you go up those incremental steps so it's not the one thing that does it it's a multitude of things that come together to try and give you some sort of a value system when you finish when you finish one aspect of the ritual and you go on to the next you've done the basic anthropology beginning middle and end you've gone into something uh, you've had the initiation you've You've achieved what you want to achieve, and you're going out of it. And you, w when you work those principles in with the um, in with the ritual itself, it, it it falls in fairly well. But the golden dawn is supposed to make us more aware. That's the first thing. That's why we do the rituals in the first place. And making us more aware depends on our value system within it. Uh, if I was put side by side with different people, we'd all we'd all see different things. And that's not. That doesn't mean we're right or wrong. It's the way we're initially made. And what will happen is that our value system will adjust to what we perceive in our psyche to a certain extent. Because the rituals are a holographic component, as I spoke to you earlier, they have a life within their own. They have a polarity within their own. And when you go through the stops and prompts, the polarity is, is work within the holographic component to make, to make, it, more, to make it more usual. Uh, uh, Francis King once said that the GD rituals were a mass attack on the psyche. And... It's not really a bad way of looking at it. Uh, it's probably an oversimplification, certainly, but it it really it really gets gets the heart of the matter and, and describing it, and um, because you you've got all these verbal cues and you've got these uh, visual cues in the ritual itself, on how this on how the thing should work, and uh, all see for example you could take things from the 110 and you could take things from the 47 and interact with them and. One is not higher than the other. That's the mistake people make. As you get up, you get more. It becomes a little bit more uh, complex in the sense of that the um, that the, the things that you look at or shown are more complex. They're more complex only from the point of view of the tree, where you have additional aspects in the tree. But they're not more complex 
uh, complex when you look at the value system of each one. There, there is stuff in the 4.7 that could be equally valid to something in, uh, in the 110. But the trouble is they're put in an area, collectively grouped, so it will form a holographic component to make it work best for you. And so that whole value system is increased by having all of these things together, which will differ from the one you went through. So you've got two holographic components, and only when you start going through these particular levels and you start putting all these little holographic universes together that you understand, you start to understand the principle. They're there for a reason. They're there uh, for incremental steps so that you can work your way through looking at the stops and prompts and what they actually mean. But to try and put a handle on these particular grades, I found is bloody nigh impossible in some areas. You can get a rough idea, you can call it a grade, you can give it a uh, thing. Just look at Mathers of 6.5, for example, when he tried to uh, explain some of these particular levers, he fell down. He really fell down. He was there with his bare ass hanging out. You know, th this, is, this is the way um, he, he failed in that area. There's no question of that. And when you look at the people trying to explain what these particular grades are, you look at the neophyte, which is incredibly, incredibly complex, more so than the other rituals. But that doesn't make them, that doesn't make the other rituals any, any less lower or higher than, than the other. It's just the way you, it's just the steps you go through. <clears throat> and then you look at the THAM. Well, the THAM one, uh, his analysis of the THAM one was terrible. It was only a summary. It was nothing like he did in the... Uh, His analysis of the, uh, the uh, Zalator ritual you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. So, it, it's, uh, it was only a summary. It got nowhere near the heart of the matter. It looked at the God forms and missed a whole bunch of God forms that was actually spoken about. So, when, 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 you, <clears throat> when you actually look at that, you think, good God, what the hell's going on here? And he didn't, he didn't look at the, uh, the detailness that he did in the Z1 and Z3. He didn't get into the detail, which he should have done. And this is, goes back to what you initially said at the start of this discussion, that uh, you have to get into it and have a look at the strong points and the weak spots. And the THAM start, rituals, uh, te not rituals, but the THAM analysis was, um, was, was really quite poor. Uh, Brody Innes, uh, in my 110 book, I've got one of the, one of the rituals uh, I said was done by Felker. It was actually done by Brody Innes, uh, thanks to Sam Scarborough, who uh, pointed that out to me. And uh, that was actually, um, that actually showed things from a totally different viewpoint. But what Mathers did, it was put it into a, 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 into, a, into a matrix of a more Christian viewpoint on how to actually interpret that, which opened a door on a lot of different levels. Um, because whichever way you cut the cake, the SM, which I think improved on the GD rituals, saw things from a Christian perspective. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Mathers, he could have looked at the Gnostic perception, but the ones in the SM tore two things. They tore the, both the Gnostic and they saw the traditional Christian values. And when they brought Rosicrucianism in, that was still within that confines. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, no, I didn't want that. Well, you know, everything is part of a whole, just the way you look at it. It, it, the Christian concept is death and rebirth, which you which you essentially get when you do the second ambulation in the north north. So you've got that you've got that same element within it. I, I and, have the uh, opinion that uh, that uh, the GD initiations they even reflect uh, to a certain degree uh, chronologically even uh, manifestation of myths and mysteries in the Western world since Egypt. Uh, for for example, I mean if we look at uh, the Egyptian. Uh, aspect of the not not and in uh, 110 with the, uh, the, the the Jewish kind of mysteries in Kabbalah and then it gets into some aspects of Greek mysteries with 3-8 and things like that and we progress forward up into 5-6 where we get to the Christian uh, period and uh, and uh, and then eventually some as elements of course of Rosicrucianism in 5-6 itself which goes to another question I have for you because when we look at this pattern of, of this continuity of myths in the Western world that is reflected in the GD initiations. When we look at the outer waters, say the initiations, how they all have a common pattern, say the same officers, the same kinds of entrances, the way of introducing diagrams, the way of presenting the whole construct and how it, it just all keeps overlapping unto itself. And then we reach the portal, it becomes a breaking point. And obviously Meekin, uh, Meekin's version of the SM portal is, is, is much more interesting because it really bridges the outer order sort of structure with and opening up the inner order one with the chief adept and things like that and obviously the five six takes on a whole uh, a whole different uh, structure how what's your recommendation to people or gd heads out there 
in formulating rituals for 6.5 and 7.4 with keeping this in mind, obviously, this continuity of myths and this also this continuity of structure. And because 5.6 is obviously very different in its structure than uh, the out of order element, the elemental initiations, but yet there's obviously a lot of common points as well. But it does take on a different flavor, a different a different angle on our work and obviously 6.5 and 7.4 could reflect this and I think the SM personally failed in this regard and as did the AO. If we toss the SM and AO rituals aside for a moment, uh, what's your recommendation to, to GD heads out there in developing 6.5 and 7.4? Uh, okay, well let's look where they've been before we look at where they go. Um, the 6.5 of Falcon was actually, I remember one of the guys uh, in one of the temples uh, back in Wellington in New Zealand. He actually had a, a six-degree Masonic book. I can't remember what it was. And there was one part where the guy was in the coffin. He was wrapped in a sheet. And just as he was about to go out of the coffin, they grabbed him and they had the hands like that, which was part of the 6-5 thing. So they took the 6-5 from a Masonic emblem. And when they got to the 7-4, they did the same thing with the Rose Choir. That's basically the outline of that. So what they did was they took what they thought was relevant and put them in that. It's Falcon. But that really doesn't, that's just taking something and just adding it in, that, which we see today in, in some GD orders. I didn't want that. And when, as you know, when I, when I, when I wrote my own 6.5 and 7.4, I tried to look at, extrapolate what was actually being taught. And obviously, you've got the farmer and the confessor. Well, the missing thing is the chemical wedding of Christian Rosencrutz. You've got to bring that into it as well. Uh, that was missing. But the trouble is it's so heavily laced of alchemy that people would probably not understand it unless they studied spiritual alchemy or, or, uh, and have an understanding of how it worked. And that's uh, one of the things that uh, I thought was necessary because the alchemy, when me can spread it out uh, in the portal, is, is very, very interesting because the first part of the portal First, uh, first lot represents the north north, and the second part represents all the elemental grades separately as you go to each component part as you go around it. And you bring in the alchemical grade, it'll t uh, the alchemical book will tell you how it's done, uh, you know, uh, and uh, those elements. And uh, so, there, so the portal was an encapsulation of the, of the uh, neophyte ceremony and uh, the four other rituals in the second part. And that's why they called it the, uh, the Rose Cross, just led into that. And uh, so there was a break up there and, and the next thing was a breakthrough and uh, when I use the alchemy I used it okay you've got all of this is in Malkuth all the four rituals are in Malkuth when you break away to go to the next level you go from the blackening stage to the whitening phase so you go into the five six as part of the uh, still part of the blackening but the purified part and then you get to the it's a bridging point till you get where you transfer to the whitening part within the five six and the, the, whole, uh, the whole part of the 5-6 then is all the whitening. And you go to the 7-4, uh, that's the 6-5, and then you go from the whitening to the yellowing. And when you go to the 7-4, you go to the yellowing to the reddening. And then when you go to the baby of the abyss, you restart again for, for a, a higher aspect of the blackening phase. And that's looking at it from an alchemical viewpoint. Very glib, I know, but th that's just a quick summarization of how, of how you could look at that. But to bring in, you've got to bring in the Rosicrucian components. Uh, and uh, as you know from the course we, we do that but it depends if someone else is looking at it I, I'd say look at the chemical wedding bring in the alchemical side of it and I think I still think that Falcon had the right idea about putting a person within a coffin and then having the certain bells and things Wade had that similar idea approach as well but it's how you frame it within that is what you do when you get to the 7-4 you've got to make your own mind up how you want to play it now I've already worked teachings that compensate for that. <coughs> you're going to have to explain the vault, uh, how the vault works, because if you're in the 7-4, which is going over the 5-6, you're going to have to explain the altar, the walls of the boat, cell by cell virtually, the ceiling, the whole thing, all the all the basic things, and how that relates to other things within the GD. So it's 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 quite a big it's quite a big thing. And when you do the 6-5, you've got to go over the portal and work out how all of that relates. That's very important as well. You've got to do an analysis of the portal and you've got to bring in the separate components and then you've got to weave them all together in, a, in an alchemical blend. That's, well, that's my take on it. Uh, that's a general... I know we're hitting, looking at things in a very general manner, but that's, that's one of the ways to do it. But I still think the person in the coffin with the 36 bells, I would keep that. Uh, it's about the only thing I would keep, <laughs> but I would keep that fundamentally. And 
I would look for additions to that, to how you would play it, because you're really going over your alchemical side of it. Yeah, alchemy is a good point. I mean, if we consider all the teachings that we have uh, in the five six, whether it's with talismans or evocation and all, basically all the Z two uh, stuff and everything that uh, pretty much every Gondan adept out there is quite aware of, uh, there comes a point where knowing of a different way to consecrate a talisman or a different way to call on a certain being or a different way to project your will to accomplish certain things or a different way to astrally travel to some other place or another form of divination kind of becomes empty uh, or it becomes useless even because uh, we've covered the entire basis of that in 5.6 and I think alchemy that's a good point you're bringing that up because it, it really is the one area in the GD that's been quite underdeveloped in the past, and that definitely uh, relates strongly to um, the chemical wedding, as you're pointing out, and it opens up potential for uh, very interesting forms of study in 6, 5, 7, 4, and even beyond. It brings in other aspects uh, to understanding uh, spiritual processes, internal transformation, uh, inner transformation, and things like this, uh, much more than even any other subsystem within the GD. So alchemy is definitely, uh, in my opinion, uh, something that needs more development in the Golden Dawn. Yeah, uh, each each person will do their own spin on it. Uh, it it means essentially going over the the basic some of the basic alchemical texts which are primary and just doing an analysis of them and showing it to people. I tried to show a little bit of this within the alchemical book as a bridging area to really start it off from six five and up. Within the five six, you have the the different levels of the five six, which math has started to employ. So did the SM, but they all stopped probably about the same time, right about just before the First World War, and I never really took it took it on that much. That was in the too hard basket. Uh, so um, when you get to a situation like that, you realise that there's a lot more to do. Now, we've, we've done it ourselves, as you know, but other people have to work their own systems, uh, which are no less valid to what, than the ones that we did. Um, this... Uh, this nonsense about bringing in um, one, one of the earliest streams of um, alchemy and saying, oh, yeah, this is it, we've got the real deal now, it's a lot of crap. Uh, the, what you've got to do is you've got to have continuity from start to finish. You know, the, the, uh, the portal, the portal summarises summarizes the elemental grades and the neophyte. The five six is the breaking off point when you get into something different. The six five is a continuum of that, and the seven four is a finish. We at that's the finish of that particular level. Then you go to the baby the abyss where you restart in a type of portal again because that's the point of massive confusion. The point of confusion, and then you go to Bina, which essentially again is the is a zealota, you know, the, the the earthy quality. How you want to play it? Of course, there's some differences there. So you're it's, we're going over ground, looking at it through different eyes and different levels. Uh, it's it's most important that uh, you at least try to do this because people are going to be stuck at one level and they're not going to get anything out of it. You know, and, uh, we've got I think we've got about 80 lessons in the portal that we've got, uh, not the portal, Baby the Abyss and things like that. So it's a quite a few years' work, you know, and, and you go through each one of these things, and, and you've got to do a full study of it. it. It's not easy, but getting back to what you originally said, how you differentiate one level to the other, that's hard because you can't just do one title because you've gone through a whole bunch of stuff and it's affected you internally and it's going to affect your internal makeup. You get two people going through the same are not going to be exactly the same when they finish spiritually because they're made differently and they come with a different baggage. So what they're going to be doing, what it can show you is it'll try and activate certain senses, awareness of the senses, of your senses, both on a conscious and on an unconscious level and that will will react differently to how you act where you are when you come in to a certain extent so there's very there's a great deal of difficulty there I, I don't try and get too hung up on it uh, I, I think when people think they know it uh, then they go over and they find they don't well, that's happened to me quite a few times and uh, so I gave up in the end and say okay it's a multi-level state and I'm just happy to do it and when I find more levels to it as I continually do just when I think I've got it nailed something else pops up but all these areas relate to other areas within within the uh, within the GD as part of pattern recognition. When you have something, you form a pattern, and then you find the pattern is transcended, at least to bigger patterns within it. And those patterns have patterns within that. So it, it's it's a whole life, but as long as you can follow the thread, and that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Is there anything else you wanted to cover? or? Uh, we've covered a fair whack, but we haven't really touched on the third order. Hmm. Uh, 
the third order is uh, is a story as a house of another horse of another color, because the third order at Furry Row was just a temple grade. It related to the temple. It didn't relate to Mahatmas ruling and ruling and sipping sipping of angels or anything along that particular area. And uh, it was um, you work within the confines of the temple and you related it to the temple or the order that you were in. If you had one temple or several, and that third order related to that. Now, most people that we hear as, oh, we've contacted the third order, contacted Mathers, which is pure poppycock. Uh, and, but that's their problem. It's not mine. If they've got to make this stuff up, they can't do it themselves. They figure it that way. And then, but you've got to create. The, whole, the Golden Dawn gives you tools to create and write your own stuff for your own temple. Okay. It will give you that uh, at a certain level. <clears throat> Go for it. Do it. Don't worry about someone else's material coming in unless you want to be a member of that particular order. Uh, if you want to, if you want to bring in uh, additional stuff like the AO, the AO did that. The AO brought in the um, uh, the material from the Cromley Temple because they wanted to fill up the uh, the five six all the way to seven four. They brought in the additional auric teachers and things like that, in which Brody Innes wrote, and it was well done. It was well timed and well done and well placed. He knew what he was doing. He he, he nailed it pretty much as far as the aspirational content went, but then. You have to look at other things apart from that because the aura is how things, how mathers work the Z1 and the uh, and, and the Z3 in a sense of sphere of sensation. So what he did, he just unfolded the whole thing, teachings of the Cromley Temple, brought it in and said, okay, that's it. And the elements of the SM who were in the secret college, um, they actually got through and they actually used this as well. So th that was how the 7-4 increased. Out of New Zealand... I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, they had all that information. Falcon may have had it, uh, or those, um, the Cromwell Temple papers. But um, as far as I know, the Cromwell Temple never got to never got to New Zealand until about 1962, I think, or 63, somewhere around that period when Wren brought it out. Prior to that, it wasn't there. So I don't think Falcon had all of this material. Um, Von Dadelson, the chief, told me that they had a whole lot of material stuck in weights uh, safe that they tried to get but couldn't get. Tony Fuller knows something about that as well. I don't know the full story on that. Uh, uh, I think, though, that the third order is a misnomer. Third order should be temple grades, temple orders. And I've had a, I've had a chat to people within third orders who are higher up. Like, you know, like Frank was higher than 7-4, and he, he spoke about certain aspects. So I spoke to uh, Bethany, uh, Bethany Jones about that. She actually spoke to, uh, spoke to me about in general, she didn't give me a specific, but she gave me enough information to tell me that it was a, it was a temple grade and not, not necessarily a grade for the order itself. So all these things were just sort of passed on. The problem they had was there was very, very little teaching as far as what we used to. The teaching was in the ritual and it had to come from within you and you had to bring it out of yourself. That's where the emphasis was. Where today we're used to having things handed to us and we had to work through that particular level. That just gives us a bit more to go on. I mean, it's no secret, obviously, that at those levels we want to move away from really elaborate ceremonies or really elaborate, uh, you know, tool making and things like that. I mean, obviously, oh. higher up we get, obviously, more mystical, simpler, less officers, uh, go, go more to the core of the matter itself as opposed to a lot of the fluff that we're used to in the earlier levels. Well, that's dead right. Uh, you brought up a very good point here. Uh, Jack Taylor's uh, uh, notebooks on uh, talisman, very, very simple. He never did the whole Z1 at all. He found that he got to the point where he found out you didn't need it. And he, uh, he got the energy levels. He knew the thing. He knew how to d divert the energy. And that's what happens when you're in ritual. You're exposed to energy around you, and you have to recognize that energy, and you do it through moving and walking. That's where your senses take over to a certain extent. But what actually happened when you got to the higher levels at Furry Ra, uh, probably a bit, bit further on, say about six, five, seven, four, a lot of them went basic. They went right back to doing things, and they went through a form of reductionism, and they didn't do the full long-winded stuff that you would do in the, in the six, five, uh, five, six. And the reason you do it in the five, six is so you understand the ritual better, so you integrate with the ritual, and so you have a fuller understanding of, of the principles behind it. 
but when you get up you start to reduce that level and you don't use as many tools and you don't put as much as much trouble on the rituals and if you go back to the uh, math of six five that's what he was doing it was uh, tony de who made uh, uh, made this point and i think it's a very valid one that uh, Mathers really didn't want to go any further than what he did, so he gave a very condensed version. It was almost done grudgingly uh, of the actual ritual, and that was that was going to be it. That was the full stop. So there was no need to go any further. And for example, but these days it's not the case. We want to go a lot further, and we have to um, we have to look at it from that perspective. So on the other hand, the on the other hand, the teachings obviously as much as as we obviously need to. To have teachings that go all the way up to the end of the system, if there is such a thing, um, the teachings themselves need to address more core elements. I mean, in my own uh, eight three studies under you, uh, I find a lot of the teachings are uh, simpler in one aspect in in their focus, but uh, much deeper and more intricate in another aspect. Like uh, as opposed to covering a lot of wide things on the periphery, they go to the core of a certain issue or matter or type of current or aspect of the system and then really uh, uh, sort of bring it out and uh, explain it much more in depth. So we want the teachings also to not be so packed with uh, external elements as in the earlier levels, but to go more to the core of the matter. Well, the simple, the simple way is that the, uh, that the second order explains the first and the third order explains the second and some of the first. So the third order is explaining the second primarily and the first as well by reducing things to a, to a nutshell. But you just can't have this reduced formula and just give it to you and run off it. You've got to start and work your way through and understand why it's reduced, how it's reduced, and have the experience of it. So all of this is part of the process that you have to do. And uh, uh, these third order temple levels that people have has to reduce that. Um, you can't have a third order that doesn't relate to the to the second and third, uh, second and first, I should say. It's got to all have to be interconnected. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. Uh, I'll give you one good example. When uh, when the Cromley Temple was starting, I saw some papers stating that um, this was the higher levels of the teachings, and if you wanted the practical levels, you would go to the you would go to the uh, AO rituals themselves. That's what they said. Uh, so, the AO rituals were then considered just the practical levels and then the higher up levels of the Kronlich were, were, were the auric papers and things like that because you'd been through all the rituals you don't understand them but they were two separate areas and Brody Innes merged them together even though even though after he merged them together they were still still two separate areas the temples were still going strong so when you look at all, all of this it shows you that you can bring in some elements uh, to do that but what they did they tried to merge all of this to try and make it a full 6-5 curriculum, but they brought in some other stuff. Brody Innes, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if he did analysis of the uh, other elemental rituals. Sam Scarborough might be able, or Tony Fuller might be able to answer that better than I could. I've, I've seen, I think he did two. I think he did the Nort Nort, I think the 110. I don't know beyond that point. These two people could probably explain that a hell of a lot better than what I could. And uh, he did that from a religious viewpoint, but his teachings were quite good. But he didn't concentrate. As you see, the 6-5 doesn't really open the door for anything, any elaborate teachings or interconnectedness. It just it tries to explain the, the names, the etymology of the names. When Mathers was stuck on something, this is, this is a good viewpoint. When he was stuck and he didn't know what to do, he looked at the etymology of something, what the names meant, how this functioned, and he gave a sign. You can see this on the Karubic papers. He did the etymology of the names. Uh, what happened was that uh, Wynn Westcott wrote a, a small one and a half page paper, and then what happened was Mathers wrote a 16 page paper, I think it was, I forget exactly, and he expanded what Mathers, uh, what Westcott did originally on the Karubic names. And all you had there was explanations in Egyptology that went nothing to explain what they did, how they worked what their function was and how to develop it. it was all etymology. Well, that's rubbish. I mean, so it, it, it's nice to have the etymology base, but then the etymology base doesn't give it to you. And, and if you go back to uh, Carnegie Dixon Jr., who, when he was head of the AO, when he did the, um, the names of the actual uh, grades and, and broke some of them down from an etymological viewpoint, which I gave in the original commentaries book, that came from a paper which you've got, um, that was done on etymology as well. So there was a, a sense of fallback through etymology would give you the answer, and it doesn't. Uh, it, it, it looks as if it will, 
and it should give you uh, if there's a connection. But if there's no connection and something's brought in ad hoc, it's going to be completely different. Or if you're trying to if you're trying to create a link, it's a, certainly a strained uh, a strained one. Mm. I mean, etymology obviously, uh, like gematria. I mean, it, it it brings in interesting little hints here and there, and and you know perspectives on things. But it doesn't really take anything further. It doesn't really open up new areas. It doesn't uh, do with the teachings what we expect it to do and uh, obviously um, the kind of study and, and, and things we're doing right now with the course uh, take things to another level completely That's uh, uh, that doesn't compare to the, those kinds of papers I think well that was the old way of doing it the codex and the hidden meanings and things and geometry was supposed to do that and I, I've never I have got into it when I first did as you would do but <clears throat> you soon leave it behind and you get into other things. I know case went bananas in that particular area, but uh, I, I don't. I think it was a poor choice. I think his teachers went array on that particular one. But uh, case, to his credit, he actually did go through the rituals from the up to the five six, from the beginning up to the five six. So he knew what they went. The only problem is that he never really had a chance to uh, to explore the Golden Dawn side. He chopped out a lot of the stuff. You mentioned earlier. Um, about the how you differentiate the rituals. Uh, well, uh, what actually happened was this: all the GD rituals in the paths. Now, the paths and the sephirot were separate entities in in in, in, in the Hebrew mysticism, and it was only brought together uh, uh, probably under the Sephir system, as far as I know. We had the sephirot sort of came in of the came in of the palm tree of Deborah, the different paths and things like that, and they moulded them together. But they were both separate entities within themselves. And what, what Mathers did was he tried to bring in, merge the two together. So what he did was when you had a, say you had a path, you had the center of the actual altar was a tarot card. And a good example is a tarot card, the universe and the 110. Now, two yeah, okay, yeah, the 2 on I beg your pardon. But what actually happened here was that um, in the 110, you had the path leading out of Tau. That was a Tau path which left behind Malkuth. And in that you had the... Um, you had the two uh, uh, 12 uh, table of shoe bread and, and the seven branch candlestick. Now those things were incorporated uh, are, in, uh, are incorporated into the universe card as the as the zodiac sign and the star over the figure. So they were they were in a previous ritual in the 110. They were incorporated in, in the 29. That was the only time that I ever saw that happen. But that was obvious because it had left Melku. And what happened was that each tarot card at the centre was a big massive card probably 28 inches or high in black and white sitting on the altar and as they would come in they would go through each diagram and say these are represented in that tarot card now the case knew this and he took it apart and he said okay well to hell with the Kabbalistic side of it I'll just in this particular instance I'll just put the tarot the tarot symbol there and we'll take away the diagrams and the ritual now I don't know what uh, I, I've only been told this by people who've got through the boat of rituals I, I've never been an initiative boater and but this is what I've been told so what actually happened was he said, well, there's no need for these additional diagrams which support the tarot card. We'll just look at the tarot card in its totality. And in ritual, you're limited to what you can do of it. So he built a course up around the initi initiatory value of it. Now, when you did this for the paths, it makes sense. But these are the active aspects. But when you get to the Sephira, which are passive, you have a new, whole new ball game. You don't have a tarot card in, the, uh, in that particular area at all. So you have a different area. So you've got one aspect of the ritual that you go through is, pass, is active, forcing your way into the Sephiroth, which is passive. And there you receive. So one is the push and the other one is the reception within that. And that goes all the way through the, uh, through the GD rituals. And Case got rid of a lot of stuff where I, I in fact, thought it was he'd they'd put a few veils up to try and under, show the understanding. But if you go and have a look at my inner teachings book, uh, I've, I've explained how the teachings of the um, uh, how how the teachings of the diagrams relate back to the tarot card. And I've given the universe card as one good example of how that goes. And then when you get to the two nine itself, you have a look at the diagrams, and they're all versions in one way, shape, or form of the universe card. You got the tree of life; he rep represents the figure. You've got these. You got the twelve circles around. And then then you've got the um, got other aspects as well all of those represent the universe card as such just in different variations but you're seeing it through a visual thing which is most important and you're trying to get the body of it so when you study all of this zodiac and seven stage system you look at the tarot card as a central point of focus so case just took took that up and ran with it as so he just said we well, don't need all the 
adjustments. You just need the tarot card, and to a certain extent, he's right. But you'd only you'd only do that if you if you uh, were trying to cut out all all the uh, all the all, all the stops and prompts and things like that. But I don't think, frankly, uh, even though he did that ritual for many many years, my understanding of doing that ritual over thirty odd years is that those prompts are very very necessary to get a balance in the ritual. But that's just my view. It doesn't have to be a gospel concept. Well, it's uh, it's okay to remove uh, things like that and go more to the core of the matter, but I think in higher levels. I mean, even in our 6.5 and 7.4, we still have tarot cards and diagrams and things relating to them, which is, uh, even at that level, is still extremely relevant. And then obviously when we talked about alchemy earlier and things like that, it's a good opportunity to bring these things together. In my own development of our uh, Babe of the Abyss ritual, uh, we'll start slowly reducing... Uh, uh, these outer elements and go more and more to the core and obviously into the third order I think we should uh, more and more uh, cut down on these things so I mean Paul Case's idea of doing that is not a bad one it might, I d it might not be a good idea to do it too early in the system it's good to have a lot of peripheral uh, material to build up the universe of symbolism before you start to break it down again So, um. well I, I originally was just going to um, my, my aim was to try and finish building the GD, this is for my own group, uh, uh, filling in the second order up to 7-4 and, and try to try to fill out what Mathers didn't. Uh, that was that was my aim. Whether I succeed or not, I don't know. Uh, I'll give it my best shot, that's all I can say. And then the way communications are being as they are, the transition into the taking in the higher levels of the SM, uh, like the Babe of the Abyss and the A3 and 9-2, rituals, uh, I, I think we're a natural transition. I mean, so you can't get away from it. But if you're going to have these things, you've got to make them work. You've got to do something. And so I've been, I, I got into that as well, which I didn't originally intend. And uh, I found out I was able to extrapolate what I got in the second order and put it in the third order, and the third order being just the temple order as such, and uh, to get more out of it, because it could go back in to the 110 and the 5-6, and, and the, uh, the uh, inner order, uh, second order and explain things at a far more far more better level because what I've done is I've had to regurgitate everything when I did the course which has taken me I think we started in 2003 and uh, we completed one aspect of it oh, uh, it says it's about what about a, about 10 years and uh, and that's going week after week uh, and uh, that's how you got to do it but in a temple you don't go week after week you might go months might get a month and they'll give you a couple of diagrams and you come back and you go through it but when you do when you do the course that we're doing it's, it's consistent all the time you're at it non-stop and that's the only way to to go and for over a 10-year period it's a hell of a lot of bloody work and even then there's more to come I, I, I've just stopped at a certain point I'm going back over it and see what I can add to it at a later stage uh, but I, I, I think for most temples they've got to they've got to do this thing first work their way through uh, be in the rituals, do the rituals, be in all positions first, have the experience of it. And, and first of all, be the problem that you've got is half these people weren't showing a lot of the stuff that we just take for granted. Uh, I've passed stuff on to you and Tony DeLuca that people would never get any outside of it. It's not secret, secret stuff, but it's enough collectively to show you there's a different dynamic in looking at something. And this has been part of, been part of the problem. Uh, I... Uh, the critique of, uh, I, I could critique some of the, the rituals of Falcon, but I think it'd be a waste of time, to be honest, uh, because um, he just did, he just followed his own nose and went that way, and I'm following mine. It's like apples and oranges. I just wanted the system more complete. I wanted to rely more on the, uh, more on the Rosicrucian idea of things. And uh, even that is, is, is a horse of another colour. Hmm. I think that about covers our, our topic for today. The various grades in the GD progression. Okay, well, I'll see you, uh, see you when I see you next. Yep, we'll talk later.